Uh, thanks, Rupal. That's uh, quite wonderful to hear. Wish my mother was in the audience to hear. Um, so, yes, yes, my, my surrogate mother is here. Um, so, uh, so we're going to so be talking about uh, tele ICU, and just, I'll just get this out sort of right up front. Tele ICU is not managing the intensive care unit over the telephone. Um, if, if that were the case, we, we would have been doing that for decades and decades. But tele ICU, uh, as we'll talk about, is actually uh, remote uh, monitoring in an in intensive care environment. Uh, but this is, uh, and I guess to start with, just by way of disclosures, tele, tele ICU systems are commercially available. People are trying to sell them. I don't have any affiliations with any of these systems, and I'm going to try very hard to not to make sure I don't sort of uh, push uh, support for for one thing or the other. Uh, the only disclosures I do have are, are the research funding. Um, so objectives for today uh, are to sort of start out by describing the ICU of the present. Uh, what are the challenges that we face every day in the intensive care unit? Uh, and then review the available data addressing the value of telemedicine initiatives uh, that are occurring in the intensive care unit. Um, and then as a step towards really the ICU of the future, of which telemedicine or tele-ICU will, is likely to be a part but not all-encompassing, uh, outline work we've been doing uh, with the development of uh, novel biomarkers for biological pattern variability in preclinical models of human disease and end with the translation of this work to the bedside and a word about the ICU of the future. So uh, the ICU of the present, um, I really like this picture. It was uh, published in the New Yorker in 2007 and it accompanied uh, an article talking about the Peter Pronovost uh, uh, checklist as far as how to uh, how to make some improvements uh, in ICU care. Uh, what I like about it is it, sh it shows sort of the complexity complexity that we deal with every day in the intensive care unit. Uh, here's an ICU room. There's all sorts of different monitors monitoring um, all sorts of physiologic parameters, many of them on a second-by-second -second basis, churning out all this data. And for the most part, none of these devices actually talk to each other. And for the most part, they don't communicate with the medical record. They're just churning out all this data, presenting it on monitors, and then it's disappearing. And you have a clinician there walking out of the room with a piece of paper with which he or she is trying to make sense of everything that's happening. So there's, there's complexity in the ICU. There's lots of devices that don't work well together. On top of this, um, this is a family circus cartoon, um, which uh, shows Billy, the young boy, and what he's doing as he walks all over the place. And I think this is sort of uh, a nice analogy for the problems with workflow that occur in the intensive care unit. So. Uh, this is meant to be everything that he thinks about doing while he's asleep, and then he wakes up and tells his mom that he's tired because he's been dreaming about doing all these things. But if you can imagine his bed as the bed of the patient in the intensive care unit, and uh, the resident goes to make rounds, they stop by, they may, may hopefully see the patient, um, they're going to go and they're going to look at the flow sheet, and then they're going to say, well, I'm going to go see what the radiology looked like. So they're going to walk over here to the radiology computer, check in that. Then they're going to say, well, not all the labs are on the flow sheet, so i got to walk over here to this computer to look at that thing. And then i got to find the nurse. She's taking care of a patient a few doors down. So they walk over here, and they get distracted by something else. And if you were to follow the steps of the resident, they're all over the ICU before they ever actually make it back to the bedside, to the to the patient, which is what we're supposed to be focusing on. And this is exactly uh, true for nurses as well. Uh, nurses are all over the place, um, having to go mix up medications over here, uh, talk to pharmacy over here. Um, uh, they're moving all over the place. Uh, and, and workflow in the ICU takes them away from the bedside. And technology has actually made this worse. Uh, before technology, most of what you needed was sort of more clustered around the patient. Now that there's all these different computer systems, you've got to access this one for this and this other one for that, it actually draws you away from the patient instead of bringing you to the bedside. And you would say, well, with technology, technology should be helping us fix all of this. But we right now walk into the intensive care unit, walk up to a medical team, and we ask the resident, what's going on with the patient in bed two? They're going to pull a stack of papers out of their pocket. They're going to rifle through them. They're going to be like, wait, no, this is not the one. This is the one from yesterday. Where did I write this down? Right? 
The same thing with the nurses. You ask them what's happening with the patient, what were their, you know, were their heart rate two hours ago. They're going to walk up to the bedside chart. They're going to look through here and say, well, this was this different yesterday? And they're like, oh, wait, I can't find that flow sheet. Maybe it's over here, right? This is, this is really insanity in, in, the, in the 21st century that this is the way we continue to track uh, all of the data, all the important data that, that are, that's being generated around our patients. So, with this as the backdrop, sort of putting this into words, uh, which what I've tried to convey in pictures, modern day ICUs contain, you know, many, many pieces of electronic equipment. Uh, and this equipment and the technology that's been brought to bear to the care of ICU patients, these things don't communicate or work efficiently uh, in an integrated fashion. And because of that, I like to argue that this poses a safety risk uh, to the patients that we care for. So. The ICU of the present is really a place where there's a lot of data, probably too much data to keep track of, and not enough information. Again, drawing the distinction between data, bits of, bits of data, and information that you can actually make a decision about or is actionable. And most of us were trained or would like to think that we're smart enough to say, you know, there's a lot of stuff there, but I can figure this out. I'm experienced. I've seen this kind of thing before. I could take in all this information, keep track of it in my brain, come up with a diagnosis, and move on. Um, but there's evidence to suggest that there's there's clear limits to human cognition. Um, there's uh, something called Miller's Law, which uh, has grown up out of a, a psychological study in the 1950s, suggesting that in short-term memory, you could hold up to seven pieces of information, plus or minus two, in your sort of short-term working memory to be able to access and use to make decisions. Um, but there's a lot of data subsequently to suggest that, um, that it's actually not seven, it's probably three or maybe four pieces of information that you could hold in your brain and act on. And there's certainly um, implications to experience and level of training here. If you're a sort of a third year medical student, you're, you're probably going to use up your three or four pieces of information remembering the heart rate, the blood pressure, the respiratory rate, and the temperature. If you're a more uh, experienced intensivist, you're going to probably remember these as sort of clusters of information. You're going to remember sort of heart rate and temperature and blood pressure maybe as one sort of piece of information together. And then you're going to remember some lab values as another piece of information. So there's sort of this meta extraction so that you can encompass more individual bits, but the bottom line is we can only handle so much of this in our brains, and if we think that we're able to keep up with this, um, we're sort of fooling ourselves. And so there's an uh, ever-present uh, cognitive overload that's present because of all the data uh, in the intensive care unit, and when you're faced with cognitive overload, what happens is you have more trouble solving problems, and cognitive overload is worsened by stress, and there's oftentimes stress in the intensive care unit. So uh, putting this all together, this is a recipe for disaster. And I, I like this. This is uh, Hansen coined the term ticker tape medicine for, uh, as an analogy for what's happening in the ICU today. This is a picture of stockbrokers from the 1920s looking at their rolls of ticker tape with information about stocks, trying to make a decision as to whether they should buy or sell. And here's a clinician in 2011 flipping through pieces of paper, looking at bits of numbers, trying to make a decision as to whether they should, you know, uh, uh, make, a, make a medication change in the ICU. And, you know, the stock market has moved beyond this. You can go online and you can e-trade and, and do all this sort of stuff, and you have all these tools to encompass this information, but these tools have been, um, have not been well applied in, in the intensive care unit. And so, you might say, well, what about the electronic medical record? Isn't the electronic medical record what's supposed to be helping us with this? And the EMR is a big step forward. Uh, but in my opinion, it essentially replaces the piece of paper at the bedside with a computer screen. And the, the, uh, the earliest versions of a bedside flow sheet in the intensive care unit are essentially that. All the data that was on the piece of paper is just put up on the computer screen. It's not sort of optimized. It's not made more efficient. And and this is not being, and this problem is not being addressed by the current uh, healthcare, uh, health information technology initiatives. When I initially started hearing about all this, I got really excited because I'm like, this is going to be great. This is exactly what the intensive care unit needs. But they're really focused um, on a lot of things that Brooke Watts talked to us about last week and not um, the integration and processing of information in the data-heavy intensive care unit. And 
I think it's it's not it's not a, just a coincidence that I, that neither at university hospitals or at the VA is there an electronic uh, patient flow sheet uh, in operation. Um, the VA has had electronic medical record for a long, long time, but it has not permeated the bedside in the intensive care unit. This is likely to change uh, in 2012, but it's it's taken a long time, suggesting that there are clear complexity co complex issues that need to be addressed. Uh, university hospitals not too long ago rolled out an electronic flow sheet at the bedside. It lasted for, I'm not sure, a few weeks and got completely rejected by the nurses. And the reason was is because it actually made things worse, not better. So when you talk to the nurses, you say, well, what happened when you had this, this well, what I did before was I checked on the patient's vital signs, I walked over to the bedside chart and I wrote them down and I was done. Now, I looked at the vital signs, I wrote them on a piece of paper, I walked across the room to a computer, I logged in, I started to do this, someone came and asked me a question, then the computer logged me back out, I had to log back in, and it took me five or ten times as long to do exactly what I could do before. And this is a clear example of technology making things worse, not better. But the other problem with this is a lot of these flow sheets, um, they're being used in the, in the operating rooms. Uh, there's anesthesia record keepers, and in the OR, the whole thing is there, but They've been designed for, you know, five-hour OR cases, not five-day intensive care unit stays. And so when you're generating data on a minute-by-minute -minute basis and you have to look at it over the course of days, you have to come up with a new way to be able to present this data. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's not going to be user-friendly. It's not going to be accessible. And if the data is a, on a computer across the room, this is, it's got to be right at the bedside. Uh, right where you're interacting with the patient. So this is just highlighting some of the reasons why these initiatives haven't been as successful. But as we start to understand uh, the problems, hopefully we can do a better job uh, implementing them. So this is just a side to, to sort of highlight all the data that we're dealing with. Again, most of the health information technology initiatives are linking, trying to link pharmacy and imaging, the medical record and laboratory data. They're really, there's less of a focus trying to encompass all of this physiologic data uh, that's being generated on a completely different time scale, not hours and days, but minutes and seconds. So again, the ICU of the present is really a place where clinicians are presented with an ever-increasing amount of raw data. Oftentimes this is in a chaotic in environment. We have the expectation that um, intensive care practitioners will be able to filter through this data. They're going to absolutely have to try to prioritize tasks to make sense of this. And we sort of just, I guess, cross our fingers and hope that they're all going to make informed treatment decisions. Um, but the reality is that work in, workarounds are commonplace. So people find ways to work around the technology. So the technology is presented to them and they figure out a way to do their job despite the technology. And anytime you implement workarounds, this is a setting the stage for medical errors. And this is uh, obviously something to be avoided. So I hope I've convinced you that the lack of an integrated system in the intensive care unit um, has the potential to lead to diagnostic errors, inefficient work, uh, alarm fatigue. The ICU sometimes sounds like a casino when you walk in there. There's bells and whistles, ding, 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 and you basically block them all out and you don't hear any of them. And worker stress and burnout. Uh, there, in American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine today, there's a study looking at worker burnout and rates of burnout at 40 to 50% in the, in the intensive care unit. Interestingly, it seems that having female members of the team leads to a decrease in worker burnout in the ICU. So we should be trying to attract more women into the field of uh, critical care medicine. Uh, and as I made the point, clinicians are often feeling burdened rather than supported by technology. And this should be the exact uh, opposite goal uh, of technology. So is there help on the way? Well, there, there are initiatives uh, with the goal of improving interoperability of devices and standardization of equipment, Health Level 7, and the Medical Device Plug and Play Initiative led by Julian Go Goldman. Um, but these have yet to be widely adapted, um, and they're being adapted by practitioners, but not necessarily the, the companies that make the devices. There's also commercial solu solutions out there, but the commercial solutions are limited by the fact that every company is trying to sell you their product and they're interested in having their monitor interact with, with the devices that they make, not devices made by another company. Until we, until we come up with a uniform standard for all devices in the ICU, we're going to be stuck here, uh, which is why uh, we've been arguing that what's needed is really a complete redesign of the ICU environment to allow integration of disparate data streams 
which acknowledges existing clinical workflows and works in, to enhance them rather than to impede them. So one clinical solution that's out there is ICU telemedicine. And this is one something that I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about today. Just a couple points to make up front. Um, ICU telemedicine is likely part of the ICU of the future, but it is, it's just one piece. It's not the whole answer. And the other thing is all of this technology, none of this technology is the answer, it's just a tool. And we have to figure out how to use that tool to provide uh, better patient care, uh, how to de decrease errors, save costs, uh, and all the things that we strive for. So uh, ICU telemedicine was perhaps first introduced in 1977 as a technological strategy to improve critical care outcomes by expanding the reach and availability of intensivist clinicians. So if we fast forward to 2011, the environment now is one where there's multiple commercial applications that offer tele-ICU. Uh, there's data out there from LeapFrog Group and others suggesting that intensivist staffing in ICUs improves outcomes. And uh, there's an intensivist workload, workload, workload shortage. This is clearly a nat national trend, but something that uh, locally here we're very acutely aware of. And as a result of all these factors, there's been a rapid expansion of tele-ICU, which now covers more than 10% of the ICU beds that are out there. And all this is occurring primarily for these reasons, not necessarily because we know that tele-ICU uh, in and of itself uh, improves things. So I hesitate. To, this is the only sort of commercial picture I have. This came from the Philips ICU website. And I only use it because I think it actually summarizes nicely what a tele-ICU is. So you have a, a practitioner here sitting at a remote location. They are hooked up with uh, voice, uh, AV, voice and audio interactions. Here's a picture of the patient and the bedside nurse. Uh, this person's uh, communicating with them directly. They have access to radiology imaging. They have access to waveform data uh, from, the, uh, from the bedside monitor. And they also uh, certainly have access to laboratory data and pharmacy information. One, thing that, one of the things that's interesting about this is that this person here is holding a piece of paper on which they're <laughs> jotting things down, right? And so again, it just the, all, what this has done is it's taken all the information at the bedside, it's transported it across the country and put it all in one spot. It hasn't actually figured out how to make it work better, it's just sort of brought it all together. And um, so, so we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. So, uh, as I've been saying, what is ICU telemedicine? It's a, it's a mechanism to relay patient data to a tele-ICU center, which is remote. This is all the type of data that's being sent. Um, ideally, there's a user interface that helps to organize patient data. All of these companies are going to tell you about their smart alarms that, you know, if you have an, a remote ICU physician monitoring 100 patients, for example, how are they ever going to keep track of 100 patients? And so they're relying on the system to to tell them when they need to worry about something. I think, in general, these smart alerts have not been clinically tested, but they're touted by companies to sell their systems. Um, and then there's a communication network that allows video conferencing with the patient and the bedside caregivers. So that's the technology. You put it in place, and then what can you do with it? Well, um, the, the one that's probably most well known is a response to physiologic instability. So the patient's heart rate goes up, their blood pressure goes down, an alarm sounds. The ICU telephysician logs in, figure out, figures out what's going on, and then talks to the bedside team to help them manage whatever's happening. Um, you can respond. You can try to intervene ahead of time to prevent this. Um, uh, there's certainly going to be, you can make changes to mechanical ventilation, review admissions to try to properly triage patients, uh, discuss the diagnosis or care plan, review antibiotics, provide education to bedside providers. And again, a lot of these are, are going to be in places where you don't have 24-7 intensivist coverage, where you're likely to have the biggest impact of this. And then best practice adherence, and we're going to come back to this, but one of the things that may be happening with this tele-ICU is that you just have somebody who's taking the time to make sure that everything we know we're supposed to be doing is actually getting done. And it's not necessarily the technology, but it's actually the proper implementation of quality initiatives um, that's, that's uh, the reason for the, the benefits. So I'm going to go through uh, three studies. Um, uh, the first one, very briefly, this is uh, one from published in JAMA in 2009. Uh, this was federally funded, so not funded by any of the companies that make uh, tele-ICU products. It was multi-center, 
and it, as are most of these studies, it was a before and after observational study design, so it's not a randomized control trial. Um, uh, looked at six ICUs with a varying case mix in five hospitals, uh, 2,000 patients before implementation, 2,000 patients after implementation of a tele-ICU system. They had good data, so they were able to adjust their outcomes based on uh, a physiologic uh, severity score. And uh, one of the limitations here is that there was full delegation, delegation of intervention authority in only 31% of the patients, which means that the ICUs that were being monitored, the, the team only gave the okay for the tele-ICU team to do whatever they wanted in 30% in of the patients. That's a double-edged sword. So the upshot of this study is that there was no overall benefit of tele-ICU on mortality or length of stay. And these are the different ICUs. This is the sort of the, uh, the before and, and after. This is the adjusted mortality. This is the raw uh, mortality. I don't show the length of stay data here. But they didn't see uh, a benefit here. So. I'm just going to transition into a meta-analysis and talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses here. So this was a meta-analysis was published this year uh, in the Archives of Internal Medicine. Looked at 13 studies involving 35 ICUs, uh, mostly MICUs and SICUs. Uh, also a number of them were mixed. Uh, a lot of these were mixed cardiovascular ICUs. Again, all these studies used a before and after design, so there's no randomization. Uh, looked at more than 41,000 patients in 27 hospitals. Uh, and there were a lot of differences in the way the tele-ICU pro program was implemented. Some places had around-the-clock monitoring, some places only on evenings and weekends, only, some places only if the, the primary team called for help. And because of the significant study heterogeneity, they were only able to uh, report on unadjusted analyses. They weren't able to adjust for um, uh, the sickness uh, or acuity of the patients. And uh, these are the 13 studies. Um, Here's the Thomas study, the one that I was just uh, that we just talked about briefly. And again, overall, they had uh, 15,800 patients uh, before tele ICU and 25,000 patients after tele ICU. And um, uh, hopefully, you can at least see this part right here. The top here is the impact on ICU mortality. Uh, here's all the studies. Here's the uh, overall effect. And there was a statistically significant improvement in ICU mortality when looking at all of, all of these studies. Um, however, when they looked at in-hospital mortality, there was a trend, but this was not statistically significant. So what they did see was looking at all these studies, there was improvement in ICU mortality, but not in-hospital mortality. And they had a, a similar uh, effect on length of stay. So looking at length of stay, there was a significant uh, overall improvement uh, in length of stay. Uh, ICU length of stay, I should say, and then when, you, when looking at hospital length of stay, uh, th this difference went away, so it's no longer statistically significant. The other thing I'll point out here is that when you look at this length of stay data, there's sort of three studies here that are way, you know, are a big improvement and four studies really with no improvement, and we'll come back to that in one second. So why might be, why might we be seeing a reduction in ICU but not in hospital mortality? So there's a lot of reasons to believe that a tele-ICU program may benefit ICU mortality. Um, tele-ICU is a multifactorial intervention, so we're going to touch on this in a little bit, but it, it doesn't always just, it doesn't simply respond to patients who are decompensating. Uh, it can also ensure uh, proper uh, implementation of quality initiatives um, uh, and provide education so that you may, there may be sort of a snowballing effect over time. Uh, typically, you have to upgrade your electronic medical record in order to be able to use a tele-ICU. So what is the effect of an EMR implementation? I mentioned the enhanced quality improvement programs on this. Um, and as to why it might not, you might not be seeing differences on hospital mortality, uh, changes in patient acuity due to improved admission triage decisions. For example, if someone comes in and they really should be made hospice, they're ready for palliative care. If they don't, if that person doesn't get admitted to the ICU, but instead to a regular floor, that's going to impact ICU mortality, but not hospital mortality. Again, that's speculation. I'm not saying that that's the only reason why, but um, these are things that uh, others have have talked about. And then, why a reduction in ICU, but not hospital length of stay? Again, there's reasons to believe that the tele ICU implementation would impact length of stay. For example, if you have an ICU 
uh, intensivist 24-7 as opposed to only during the day, uh, you might be more aggressive about weaning patients from mechanical ventilation. In the old days, maybe you would just try in the morning. If it didn't work, we're going to wait till the next morning. But if there's an intensivist there at night, they might try again. If they get the patient exhibited at night, that might shave a day off of their ICU length of stay. Uh, also, a greater willingness to transfer patients out on off shift. So if you saw the patient in the morning and things were a little unstable and you wanted to see how, whether their fever came back or whatever, or whatever, or their blood pressure stayed stable, if there was an intensivist who could walk in and evaluate and say, yes, things have been stable for the last 12 hours, this patient is safe to transfer to the floor, that it would, uh, would again be a, a reason why ICU length of stay might be decreased. Um, so some important things to keep in mind here, though. The study design, the before and after observational study, doesn't allow for, for causal inference. So you don't know whether these, there was a cause and effect relationship. You just know that there was an association. Uh, another thing that comes up are, is the question of, are nighttime complications really the problem? This is one of the things that's been touted as why tele-ICU is a good idea, because patients get sick at night, and if you've got an ICU doctor who can remote in and see the patient and fix the problem, uh, they're going to do better. But is that really what we're doing, or are we simply implementing evidence-based practices more properly? And this is something that could be done locally. You don't need a doctor over the, over the Internet to help you, you know, make sure that all your patients are getting DVT prophylaxis as indicated. Um, and maybe what we should be doing is focusing on daytime applications in ICUs where there's not access to a trained intensivist. Uh, and lastly, uh, one of the things that came up was the financial conf conflict of interest. And if you looked at the, this is the meta-analysis, and this did not achieve statistical, statistical significance, I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this, but this line here is studies with vendor affiliation, and the IC, uh, impact on ICU length of stay was minus 3.54 days, whereas studies without vendor affiliation, the impact was uh, basically nil. And so, you know, it's... It just calls into question whether if your study is being funded by a company that gave you all this really cool equipment, whether you're going to be very motivated to, um, to implement it well, perhaps, uh, and thus uh, maybe see an, uh, uh, so, uh, see an impact. And then this calls into question the generalizability of the conclusions. So, and then I'll sort of conclude the, the tele-ICU part here with talking about another study that was published this year, and I think this is one that the residents have, may have talked about in their journal club. Uh, published by Lilly uh, and colleagues um, at the University of Massachusetts. It's a pro they used a prospective step stepped wedge clinical practice study, which basically means that they rolled out tele-ICU in one ICU, and then a little later they rolled it out in the next one, and then the next one, and the next one. So they didn't roll it out everywhere all at once. So they have data, sort of a, a pre-tele-ICU cohort, and then sort of a stepwise fashion of pre and post, and then at the end, everyone's post tele-ICU inflammation implementation. More than 6,000 patients. All of these ICUs, it was two campuses, but a single academic medical center. So I think this is important. And uh, the all of the doctors working in the tele-ICU were also working in the target ICU. So this was basically taking doctors out of the team that works in the ICU and saying, part of your job is going to be to work in this tele-ICU part of the time. And you're going to be working and interacting with nurses and doctors that you know, that you're comfortable with, that you're very familiar with the, the workflow and, and, the, and the approach to care. And so uh, I think this is important to remember when we talk about how sort of successful the, their implementation was. And then the other thing was the telemedicine team had full discretion. So they, could, they were given full ability to go in and treat the patients um, however they saw fit. And again, uh, this was funded by, solely by the University of Massachusetts, so not funded by a company, but if everything was funded by your institution, you can be sure that there was very strong institutional commitment to the success of this. So whether that involves staffing or whatever it was, if the, if the, if the institution bought all of this equipment, which is millions and tens of millions of dollars, um, they were going to follow that up with whatever other commitment uh, was necessary to make it work. Also, uh, these study authors implemented a very complex intervention where they enforced daily goals, they reviewed evidence-based practices, in addition to responding to bedside alarms. So this here just summarizes all the things that they, that they did, um, which we've been talking about what you can do in the tele-ICU. This is their um, enrollment of study participants. They had very few patients that were excluded. They ended up with 1,500 patients 
before uh, implementation and 4,700 patients after implementation. Uh, these are the patient characteristics in the pre-intervention and post-intervention uh, groups, and there's a lot of statistically significant differences between these groups. Uh, and so this is important to keep in mind. The Apache 3 score was higher, meaning the patients were sicker in the post-intervention group, uh, as was their acute physiology score. Uh, <coughs> Less percentage of patients were on mechanical ventilation. Is this because the tele-ICU team was better at using non-invasive ventilation to prevent the need for mechanical ventilation? Or is it something different about the patients? Um, and so I point this out because on one hand, you could say, well, the patients were sicker. So if they did better and the patients were sicker, then this is really a home run. On the other hand, whenever there's differences in, a, in, a, in study groups, in a study that's not randomized, there's the, raises the possibility that there's unmeasured variables that are responsible for these differences that are different than the, the, the targeted uh, intervention. And so here's the meat of the study. Um, they were able to reduce ICU uh, mortality from 10.7% to 8.6%, an impact that was statistically significant and that, that uh, persisted after adjustments for uh, appropriate variables. Um, this is a pretty this is a pretty good mortality rate. Um, hospital mortality was 13.6 to 11.8, not immediately statistically significant, although a strong trend, and, after, and it was significant after adjusting for variables. And then looking at uh, both ICU and hospital length of stay, there was a significant decrease in both of those variables with uh, this team's implementation of a tele-ICU. Um, the other thing that they looked at was they really focused on ensuring best practices. And so you can see, making sure in the pre-intervention group, 83% of the patients had appropriate stress ulcer prophylaxis, 96% in the after group. DVT prophylaxis went from 85 to 99.5% of the patients getting this. Cardiovascular protection, which was a beta blocker in appropriate patients, went from 80 to 99%. You can see some of these huge uh, odds ratios. Uh, this one I found very interesting. Uh, basically a VAT bundle was only 33% implemented and only went to 52% implementation. This is something locally we've been able to achieve essentially 100% with VAT bundle. So you know, I'm not sure why this was so low and why the tele-ICU didn't do a better job of it. Um, and the other thing about this is their ventilator associated pneumonia rates, 13% is very high. This is well, this is well above uh, national benchmarks for that. And they did bring it down to 1.6, which, which is a reasonable probably a reasonable number. Uh, they didn't have much catheter-related bloodstreams, either infections either before or after. So even this study, uh, although it had this step wedge design, it's still you're unable to draw causal inferences directly. Um, there was a lot of heterogeneity between the groups at baseline, which I mentioned, suggesting that there may have been unmeasured variables or secular trends. Again, this is the idea that as you're doing this, you're rolling out education about quality improvement projects and people are just getting, uh, doing a better job of getting patients on the right antibiotics the first time, the right jobs of uh, getting them on DVT prophylaxis the right time. Uh, and as all that adds up over time, uh, you see an improvement in mortality for those factors, not because of the implementation of a tele-ICU. Um, they tried to, they made an adjustment to see what was the impact of best practice adherence to the overall impact, and they, they doing some statistics that I did not fully comprehend, uh, suggested that this probably uh, uh, contributed about 25 to 30 percent of the effect, suggesting that, um, you know, there were things intrinsic to the tele-ICU that were responsible for this, but, um, you know, so, which is probably true, but I, I'm not sure about that 25 to 30 percent. Again, reinforcing this was a single center, uh, study with shared physicians who had full discre uh, discretion. The other thing was this was not comparing in-house intensivists to a tele-ICU in intensivist. This was comparing, the, you know, the model we have here more or less, which is a resident taking care of patients to an intensivist. And I think there's a lot of reasons to think that if you take someone who's in their first or second year out of medical school and compare them to someone who has 10 years of practice as an, intens as an intensive care physician, that there should be some uh, improvements in, in mortality that come along with that. So again, questioning how much of it is the actual technology and how much of it is everything that surrounds the implementation of the, the technology. So also this year, uh, in the uh, Critical Care Society's Collaborative uh, put out a, uh, 
basically a statement about where they saw the needs for future research to go. And they pointed out what we've been talking about, which is the biases of the available studies. Uh, and we sort of talked about all these things. And also pointed out what we've been talking about is that the implementation of a tele-ICU is associated with lots of different uh, interventions, not just the presence of different technology. And they highlighted the need for future studies that in future studies, we need to standardize the approach to assessing the pre-implementation ICU so we know sort of where we started from and standardizing a lexicon for defining what the telemedicine intervention was so we know what we did. And only then, uh, in this, probably in the setting of randomized studies, will we, will we be able to really see what is cause and effect here. And key topic areas are the structure, so what is the structure of the ICU team on site and the structure of the tele-ICU team, the process, how is... Uh, tell the ICU implemented and, and what outcomes are going to be most important. So um, I do think that tele ICU is going to be is part of the ICU of the future, but it's really not the whole uh, answer. Uh, what we really need to strive for is the uh, development of a situational awareness for caregivers in the ICU. And part of that is being able to identify a discrepancy between what is happening and what should be happening. So if you initiate an intervention, you expect a, a certain effect. And if you're seeing that effect, then you know what's happening. If you're seeing something else happening, that should early on alert you to the idea that something different other than what you thought was happening is happening. And hopefully a move to what we're, to move from a more or mostly reactive model to more of a proactive model where we can try to anticipate patient deteriorate, deterioration and intervene to prevent it. And the tools that can exist to try to do that um, are going to are uh, will be leveraged off of clinical informatics, and they need to um, identify bedside patient management decision support. So helping you make decisions, pointing things out, reducing the number of variables that need to be interpreted. So as you're measuring more and more stuff, you have to somehow consolidate it so you can present it to someone so that they can internalize it. And we need to acknowledge the complexity of that, that the complexity of the system exceeds the ability of any one individual. So we need to move away from this idea that the master clinician can just walk up, take all of this in, and figure out what's happening. And so this implies the complexity of the patient and also the complexity of the signals that we're measuring. And with that, I'm going to transition into some of the work that we've been doing in the lab, looking at uh, biological signal variability. The idea here is that these signals that we measure, the EKG, for example, we, that it's extracted and we're presented with an average heart rate over minutes or over an hour. And there, it's, it's quite clear that there's information in the signal itself that is not being uh, measured or being appreciated when you look at such a, a low time scale uh, abstraction. And this is founded on the idea that biological systems are complex and their, their outputs exhibit variability. The idea that there's a healthy amount of variability in any signal. Too much variability is a bad thing, but too little variability is a bad thing. And there's a growing appreciation that changes in variability are clinically irrelevant, meaning that if we can measure these, we may be able to extract information about how sick our patient is or whether they're uh, getting better or worse. Um, and work that we've been doing uh, has been geared towards isolating the stochastic or random aspects of signal variability from the deterministic or um, uh, aspects of signal variability that have a memory to them and have been applying some tools, uh, in particular surrogate uh, comparisons, uh, to try to extract nonlinear properties from the signal and I'll hopefully show you over the next couple minutes that we've been able to uh, see that that nonlinear complexity in a signal seems to track with ha with uh, severity of illness. And this is this is a list of preclinical models that we are using um, in the lab. So if there's people who are interested in looking at these types of things, they should come talk to me. Um, the I'm going to just briefly talk about the, the first two. Um, why we why we use preclinical models? Well, one, they're useful because we can understand sort of the underlying mechanisms that are responsible for generating variability, but we can also use them to develop biomarkers of disease severity that we can hopefully use to predict prognosis or reversible pathophysiology and establish feasibility for translational studies. So this was a, this was a study done by Ben Young um, uh, when he was uh, in the lab as a fellow, and basically uh, what we did was... Uh, we had three groups of animals. One group got a low dose of intratracheal bleomycin to, in, 
to initiate lung injury. One group had a high dose to generate more severe bleomycin. And then we had a sham surgery control group that had saline installed, instilled into their lungs. We measured breathing patterns um, at day seven, and then we saw whether uh, breathing patterns correlated with the severity of lung injury. These are the three groups, the control, the low dose, and the high dose bleomycin. You can see that there's a stepwise increase in lung inflammation and lung injury here is quantified by protein content in bronchiovelar lavage fluid. Again, control one unit and three unit bleomycin. There's a stepwise increase in uh, lung injury. Uh, these are breathing patterns. Um, this is breathing pattern over about 30 seconds, and then this is the breathing pattern presented as a cycle triggered histogram. Uh, things that are obvious here is that there's a big increase in respiratory rate quantified here. So animals with lung injury breathe faster. There's no surprise there. I'll just point out that the low and high dose groups breathe faster to the same extent. So you weren't able to tell which group was the low and which group was the more severe lung injury based on respiratory rate alone. Um, but if you look at um, the shape of the breathing pattern here, uh, hopefully it's apparent that there are differences in the actual shape the slope at which it goes up, the slope at which it comes down. And so we began to ask, can we use a complex systems analysis approach to try to measure the changes in the shape of the breathing pattern? And so I'm not going to get into any of the details there, but this is sample entropy. It's a measure of, of complexity or disorder. Uh, and using a comparison of uh, surrogate to original data, we were able to quantify this difference be between the two curves, and we can see a stepwise increase in this uh, measure which we uh, are calling the nonlinear complexity index. And the, the idea here is that the amount of nonlinear complexity goes up in sort of a stepwise fashion as, as the severity of lung injury worsens. Um, and so we'll, what we'd like to be able to do is try to measure this in humans to say when you come in with lung injury or mentally associated lung injury, um, can we get a sense for how sick you are uh, based on the complexity of your breathing pattern? And then we did a receiver operating characteristic uh, curve analysis, or ROC curve, uh, and we looked at the uh, sensitivity and one minus specificity of the nonlinear complexity index, and it had an area under the curve of 0.933. Um, so again, these are preclinical models, but the idea here is that the, these um, establishing feasibility for translational studies to look at patients with lung injury. And then we went on in a separate study uh, to ask how soon are these changes occurring in this study, we only looked at the high-dose bleomycin group, and what we saw, we saw breathing pattern changes as early as 24 hours. In the other study, we were looking seven days out, so as early as 24 hours after the induction of lung injury, we saw increases in uh, the nonlinear complexity of the signal. And uh, interestingly, um, we thought maybe this had something to do with the development of inflammation. We measured inflammation, or we measured cytokines in the blood, and we saw no change there. Uh, but when we looked at the area postrema here, and the, the NTS, uh, we saw increases in the amount of cytokine expression in those areas. And we, we haven't been able to establish a causal relationship between that and the changes in breathing pattern. Um, but there's a clear association. And again, here, this is, uh, this is a staining for IL-1 beta in the NTS, uh, neuronal staining, IL-1 beta staining, and then co-localization in a bleomycin and saline treated animal, showing that there's increased expression or presence of IL-1 beta in uh, neurons in the NTS at a time when there's changes in breathing pattern variability. The NTS is an important place because it's a place where a lot of cardiopulmonary afferent information is all being integrated. Um, and so it's reasonable to think that that may have something to do with this. Um, I'll briefly touch on this uh, preclinical model because I think it's really exciting. This is work that was done by Kui Zhu, uh, who's in neurology. She basically has a model of cardiac arrest and resuscitation. So she paralyzes. Um, uh, animals, she uh, stops their hearts with uh, with potassium, lets them have a stop heart for a while, and then resuscitates them with intubation, ventilation, chest compressions, and vasopressors. And um, basically, she in this model, she has about a 50% survival at four days. So she looks at half half the animals die. By four days, half the animals are still alive at four days. And if you look one day out, all of these measures are identical. If you look at breathing pattern, this is a busy slide, but I'll just uh, focus you on the day one data, one day after cardiac arrest and resuscitation. Uh, this white bar are the survivors, and this sort of gray bar here are the non-survivors. 
and respiratory rate, tidal volume, and minute ventilation are essentially identical in these two groups of animals. So you can't tell the difference between them looking at the breathing pattern. She looked at the hypoxic ventilatory response in a study she published years ago and saw that the hypoxic ventilatory response was blunted in the non-survivors and while decreased from baseline, was maintained at a higher level in survivors, suggesting that if you could get the guts together to make your recently resuscitated patient hypoxic and looked at how much they augmented their ventilation, you could make a guess as to whether they were going to live or die. And so that's not really translatable. You're not going to make people in the ICU hypoxic just after resuscitation. But we said, well, why don't we take a look at their breathing pattern? And we're just getting the, the, our N up on this. But what we're seeing is an increase in this nonlinear complexity, the same type of increase we saw with acute lung injury severity that's occurring in the non-survivors, but not the survivors one day after resuscitation. So if this is borne out, uh, this is a potentially a very non-invasive marker of breathing pattern that could be applied shortly after cardiac arrest and resuscitation to try to make an estimate of, of ultimate survival. And uh, it's looking like there's uh, changes in, this is a cast based staining, so looking at apoptosis in the rostroventral lateral medulla. Um, and so the, this is perhaps the severity of uh, apoptosis that's occurring in the brain stem is, is driving these changes. So in the last few minutes here, I want to just get back to the, to the bedside. You know, doing studies in animal models is one thing. Doing it at the bedside is a little bit more complicated. Uh, however, we're, we're starting to do that now. One study we have uh, currently enrolling patients in the ICU is one looking at liberation from mechanical ventilation. And just for the house staff, um, hopefully you guys know this from rotating uh, with us, but uh, liberation is a multi-step process. Initially, you're going to do some sort of readiness testing, looking at the weaning parameters that we talk about all the time. If those are suggested of the likelihood of weaning, you're going to go on and do a spontaneous breathing trial and then make the decision to extubate. And what we're asking in this trial is whether breathing pattern and heart rate variability measured during the spontaneous breathing trial, can it be a predictor of who is going to be successfully extubated and who is likely to fail extubation? Um, and this is important because uh, the long year on mechanical ventilation the more problems you have, but there's also problems associated with uh, the need for reintubation. So we're part of a multi-center study that's uh, uh, who the overall study PI is Andrew Seeley in Ottawa, Canada, uh, basically measuring uh, heart rate and breathing pattern variability uh, during spontaneous breathing trials. And we're up to about a half dozen patients, and we've and we we're still enrolling. So things are moving well on that front. And this is just to show you. This is data from one of the patients collected from the ICU. Um, the, just to give you a sense that the process is a little bit dirty, there's artifact in here. This is, this is probably the time, this is the pre sb spontaneous breathing trial period. It's probably when they were uh, switching over to spontaneous breathing trial. So you have to go in here and you have to find sub where the signals are clean and without artifact. And then if you really zoom in, what we're measuring is an end tidal CO2 signal, which can give us uh, the onset of, of exhalation, inspiration, exhalation and markers of each R wave. And so we can look at heart rate variability and breathing pattern variability. Uh, ultimately, you know, what we're doing is we're extracting data and we're sending it to a computer and we're analyzing it days later. But ultimately, you like to be able to do this in a real-time fashion. And again, this is just showing some of the data from this patient, um, which I'm going to skip over. So in the last couple of minutes here, uh, the future of critical care is really transforming multimodal patient data, all this data that's being generated in the ICU, into actionable information so people can know what to do with it, ultimately to improve patient outcomes and reduce health care costs. How do we get there? Well, we need to develop a reliable predictors of outcomes, um, hopefully ag aggregate predictors of sequential outcomes, basically saying if, if these types of events are happening and we can track them, we think this is going to lead to a good or bad outcome. Um, and our approach has been to develop an open source information architecture that supports the acquisition, time synchronization, and archiving of multimodal physiologic waveform data at the device level. We tried initially to work with companies Philips or GE, people that make monitors, and they're really not interested in doing this. And so I think we're going to have to do it really at the device level. So go down to individual devices in the ICU room, find a way for these devices to plug together, get this data out so that, because once you start populating a database with this information, it not only becomes available to the clinician to help make decisions, it populates a research database where we can then uh, um, uh, 
implement studies based on the computational models that we've been developing in the animal models. And uh, this is sort of uh, my vision of what this would look like. You know, you have all of this is all phenotypic data here, nursing notes, lab values, radiology, um, you know, the electronic medical record. Here's physiologic data, respiratory rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, all this stuff we're measuring. You need to get this all together in one place so that you can see it all in one place at the bedside. Um, we need to then leverage uh, what we know to, to support clinical decisions. Support. So say, tell, tell you that, you know, I, the, the computer knows that this patient is on mechanical ventilation and it knows the bed is talking to the computer and saying the bed is, the, the physical therapist just came in, did physical therapy and didn't put the bed up to 30 degrees to prevent aspiration. The bed should be able to tell the computer and the computer should be able to alert you to say, hey, this patient has fallen off of their VAT bundle. A nurse shouldn't have to remember to walk in every time a consultant or a, a, an ancillary uh, person is in the room to make sure this is happening. And then advanced clinical decision support. This is basically implementing things that we've been developing in animal models to see if we can make them work in the ICU. And ultimately, you need an intuitive visual display, something that presents all this information in, in a way that's usable by the clinician and doesn't overwhelm them with data. So uh, coming back to sort of our ICU, the present, and the problems that we talked about there, what will the ICU of the future look like? Hopefully, it will be one in which devices communicate directly to the electronic medical record. It's ridiculous for a nurse to have to walk in, look at the monitor, say, oh, the heart rate's about this, come back, and then type that into a computer. The, the, the monitor should dump that information directly into the medical record. The, the infusion pump should tell the medical record exactly the rate at which the drugs are going in. The nurse shouldn't have to take time to put that in there. Um, Real-time signal analysis. This data is being collected in real time. There's no reason we can't analyze it in real time and give that information to the clinician. For smart alarms, which are multimodal, meaning that if you have an artifact on your EKG, the monitor should be able to say, well, I'm also measuring blood pressure and respiratory rate. And if both of those are stone cold normal, this is probably an artifact. Let me take a second and check this out before I just blast off an alarm that's going to uh, distract people from what they're doing. Hopefully be able to promote early detection. Support workflow that brings providers back to the bedside. Again, this is the idea that all this has to be right at the bedside on a, on a monitor, and when the, when, this, when the information comes back to the patient's blood flow is decreased, the nurse should be able to go up to the monitor and say, I want to increase the dose of Levofed. She should enter that into the monitor. The, the computer should go to the infusion pump, increase the, the rate. It should go to the medical record and chart it with one push of a button. There's no reason the nurse has to say, okay, this happened. Go in, punch on the pump, come out to another computer, type this into here, call the pharmacy and say, we're going to need another bag sooner because I increased the rate. This should directly communicate to the pharmacy and tell them we need to make a bag sooner. These are all efficiencies of workflow that will decrease errors um, and, and hopefully make working in the ICU a bit easier. Uh, so I guess I think with that, my time is up, so I'm going to stop.